So I'm going to talk, as Brendan just said, on the food microbiome from farm to colon all the way through. And it's going to be a very high level view, just kind of a bird's eye view of the influence of the microbiome throughout the food chain. And I'm going to particularly emphasize how we can take advantage of the microbiome or how we can mine the microbiome for interventions that we can use along the way or for treatments or therapies that we can use along the way. So the microbiome itself is probably, oh, sorry, there's something wrong with my slide here, the hottest area in science. This is a search I did just a, a week or so ago on Web of Science, and there have been almost 100,000 papers published with the terms microbiome or microbiota in the last uh, eight or nine years. About 6,000 of these have been in the food area. So a, a huge area with massive attention, of course, lots of different claims and counterclaims of how important the microbiome is. Just to emphasize why the microbiome might be important, I think I don't need to convince an audience like this that we live in a microbial world. So microbes appeared about three and a half billion years ago. They made all of the oxygen that we breathe. They shaped the planet uh, beyond all recognition. They sometimes they said the moon is what the earth would be like if it didn't have microbes. And we only appeared one or two million years ago. And so we evolved as did all plants and animals into a microbial world. And as we evolved, we adapted microbial molecules for our own use. So sometimes it seems extraordinary that bacteria, bacteria living in the gut, for example, produce molecules like serotonin and acetylcholine and GABA, which are brain chemicals as we would characterize them. But of course, the real truth is that we adapted these molecules as we evolved. And so plants, animals, and humans all speak the same language as bacteria. So there's lots of communication between microbes and host. And if you want any evidence of how important the microbiome is in, human, in humans and in mammals in general, you'll see that mother's milk is full of sugars that the baby cannot digest. So why did uh, mammalian mothers evolve a milk which does not feed the baby, but which feeds the baby's microbiome? And it's pretty obvious that the mother is very concerned with getting the baby off to the best possible start in terms of having a diverse and stable microbiome. I wrote this article last year, it's kind of tongue in cheek, but it's, you have the microbiome you deserve. What I mean by that is your microbiome at this point in time is a product of all of the things you have done to this point. All of the microbes you've encountered, those which have managed to colonize you and those which have been rejected. And the kind of factors that influence what type of microbiome you have include, obviously your host genetics, birth mode, whether you're breastfed or bottle fed, your environment, you have animals in your environment, that makes a difference, your lifestyle, and food plays a big role. The diet plays a big role in shaping your microbiome, which hopefully throughout most of your life is very stable uh, and very diverse. Things like antibiotic treatment and disease can influence your microbiome and maybe your microbiome can influence disease as well. And then there's a very important kind of degeneration of your microbiome as you age, at the same time, your health degenerates. And is that connected? And which way is it connected? Is it association or causal? And diet can play a big role there as well. So the microbiome is very important. And just in the context of this meeting, a paper just came out in Nature Reviews, Gastroenterology and Hepatology, literally a couple of days ago, making the point very strongly that microbiomes actually are biofilms. Most of the microbiomes in the human body and in other biomes and other environments take the form of biofilms. So anyone who's studying biofilms is really studying microbiomes and, as well and vice versa. And Rob already introduced this, but I, I'm just gonna go through it very quickly for the purposes of some of the data I'm gonna show. The microbiome can be characterized using next generation sequencing and bioinformatics. And both the methods that you employ to do the sequencing and the bioinformatic methods you use are very important, but I don't have time to go into that now. But what you can do is you can take a microbiome, the, all of the bacteria in a particular environment, and you can look at the community composition by using things like 16S ribosomal RNA sequencing. Now, what you get is relative abundances and you don't see the very uh, minority species, but you get a good sense of the, the composition of a particular 
uh, microbiome. You can go on even further and do total community uh, gene content shotgun sequencing, as it's usually referred to, and actually sequence all of the genomes of the bacteria present in a particular environment. And then you can map those genes and those gene products onto metabolic maps and get a sense of what the community is capable of doing in terms of metabolic uh, output. And of course, we can use things like metatranscriptomics and metabolomics to look at which genes are actually switched on and which products are being produced. So we can get an incredible in-depth analysis of a microbial community through these next generation uh, techniques. And sometimes the information is literally overwhelming and very difficult to handle. And just to, it's a kind of an artificial divide, but microbiology versus microbiome approaches. Microbiome is a subset of microbiology, I think. But in microbiology, you use classical techniques. It can tell you how many of a targeted species are present, but you have to know the species and play it on the appropriate agar. Obviously only culturable organisms will be detected, but it is quite numerous for those organisms that you can detect. And then of course you also have the organisms now growing in the lab and you can characterize them and interrogate them for their properties. Whereas the microbiome can identify all of the microbes present in a particular environment or biome, including unculturable microbes, but it's not as numerous. You generally get a relative abundance of species present, but it can give you the genetic and metabolic potential of a community. And of course that's uh, very intriguing results to get. So from farm to colon, I'm gonna start by looking a little bit at farm microbiomes. How can we use uh, metagenomics and microbiome type approaches to influence uh, farming and production of food? And here's an example of a study that was done, uh, was published just last year or two years ago now in 2019, which looked at the microbiome in pigs throughout uh, their, their growth cycle. See there, see there through lactation and nursing and growing and finishing. And you can see the evolution of a more and more diverse microbiome. And then the microbiome kind of settles down. Obviously you can identify each of these species. New species appear and become more dominant. Species appear and then disappear. So it gives you a really in-depth view of the sequence of events that happens during the development of, a, of an animal like the pig. And it also showed that diet, especially crude fiber, is a major factor in shaping the gut microbiome. And then you can go a step further and say, well, if the microbiome is shaping animal performance and growth, can you transfer the later microbiome, the more stable microbiome back into the younger pigs? And in fact, you can, and what it did do was it significantly increased growth performance. So it might explain why pigs are, are coprophagic and why the ingestion of feces from older animals could well have a beneficial effect on pigs' performance. But we could somehow industrialize this process as well, this natural process. We have looked at mining the porcine microbiome. So salmonella has been mentioned quite a lot so far. Salmonella can obviously lead to losses and downgrading of meat, but it can also be transmitted to humans through contaminated food and maybe through other means. And what we did was we isolated thousands of strains, over 10,000 strains from porcine microbiomes of salmonella-free pigs in salmonella-infected herds on the premise that maybe the reason these pigs are not infected is because of their microbiome. And we identified strains with anti-salmonella activity. And we narrowed it down to five of these 10,000 strains. And when we re-administered these strains into pigs as a probiotic, essentially, what we saw was that the pigs receiving the probiotic, we, we gave the pigs probiotic for uh, 30 days, so for a month, and then we deliberately infected the pigs with salmonella, 10 to the 8 salmonella. And if you look at the graphs on the right, you can see that day four after giving salmonella, 80% of the not control pigs had developed diarrhea, whereas none of the probiotic fed pigs had. In clinical scores, in weight gain, in salmonella shedding, on every measure that we looked at, the pigs that had received the probiotic were faring significantly better than those that had not. So we can mine the microbiome for novel interventions that could prevent salmonella infection and salmonella spread and salmonella contamination of food. We can do something very similar in mastitis. Mastitis is the most persistent disease in dairy cattle. 
has to be treated with antibiotics, and then the milk has to be withheld. It's the most costly animal disease, costing billions of euros every year. Uh, what we were able to do is we infected the, or uh, we infused infected quarters with a harmless micro microbe isolated from the dairy microbiome. Or we gave the, the animals the leading antibiotic treatment in two different arms. And what we saw was a resolution of mastitis in nearly 75% of the animals in both groups. So the probiotic, the culture, worked as well as the gold standard antibiotic. But then the milk doesn't have to be withheld. And of course, the animals have not been antibiotic treated and were not generating antibiotic resistance. Another example connected to climate change is, of course, the emission of methane from animals. About 95% of the methane produced in the rumen of an animal is ejected uh, orally through erectation. And what people have done is characterize the rumen microbiome. You see it there on the left, very complicated, very diverse. And the smaller graph to the right just shows the methanogens, the ones that are actually producing the methane. And what we're doing in a project called MethLab, very well and uh, nicely named, is we're isolating bacteria from the rumen of animals that can eliminate these methanogens and reduce the emissions of methane from these animals. And trials are going on right now in, uh, in both uh, Ireland and in New Zealand to test these strains. So lots of potential there for interventions. What about the factory? Well, Rob already introduced this idea of using metagenomics to screen factories. We've done something similar. Here we've looked at the dairy microbiota all the way from the farm bulk tank to skim milk powder, one of the main products that uh, many dairy factories produce. And we went through every unit process throughout the entire factory. And we were able to detect the different levels of bacteria, the diversity, the types of bacteria, all the way through the, uh, the food chain, if you like, from the animal to the uh, bulk bag of skim milk. And Particular note there was that low levels of thermophilic bacteria present in raw ingredients or present very early in the, in the line can become the dominating uh, bacteria later on after the unit process has been applied. This work was led by uh, Paul Cotter in Chagas and Moor Park uh, here in Ireland. And you can go into individual factories, much as Rob uh, already showed us, and you can swab different sites. Now there are problems with dealing with these low microbial load samples, and, and Rob touched on that as well. And here you see different sequencing methods applied at different times uh, throughout the uh, winter, essentially in, a, in the same plant. And again, you see the progression, the types of bacteria that, are, that appear and emerge, and the changes over time. Lots of information that can be then used to inform hygiene in the factory. I want to move on and say something about food microbiomes, because this is becoming a very important area as well, characterizing the, the total bacteria present in food, uh, in foods on the product or on the shelf. Here's a really nice example from Cyprus. This work was led by Eleni Camillari, who's now in our lab as it happens, but she did this work when she was in Cyprus. And what she showed in the Venn diagram on the top left was you can easily distinguish traditional halloumi cheese from industrial halloumi cheese by the, microbiome, by, by the microbiome signature in those cheeses. And this was a bit of a problem that uh, industrially produced halloumi has been passed off, if you like, as artisanal halloumi, but now that can be resolved. And what they could also show was that um, halloumi made in multiple sites around the island of Cyprus using different types of animal milk, each cheese has a distinct microbiome. So you could use the microbiome signature as a kind of an uh, Appalachian uh, of origin control A to, to see which cheese was made where and to make sure that cheeses were not being masqueraded as local if they were not. And this could be used, of course, for many different artisanal products. So a really nice example there uh, from Cyprus. And what Paul Cotter again and his group have shown is he can use microbiome to solve decades old problems. So there's a problem in, in cheese and certain cheeses called pinking. And you can see it there on the photographs in the top right. This pink discoloration can appear in certain cheese types. And this was first observed in 1933, but the microbiological basis has never been determined. But if you look at the graphs here on the, the bottom uh, left, I'll just bring up a pointer here. Uh, you can see that in the control cheese, 
the entire composition of bacteria in the control cheese was essentially from the defining firmicutes, as it was in the defect cheese. But the defect cheese also had a, a trace of these Deinococcus thermus phylum. And then when you went in a more detail, these turned out to be members of the family Thermaceae. And went even more detail, you could find this species thermus present only in the cheeses that had this pink discoloration. So what they did obviously was reintroduce thermus into control cheeses, cheese manufacture, and that recreates the pink defect in test cheeses. So a problem that had been there for almost 80 years and had never been solved by standard microbiology was solved within literally a matter of months using microbiome technologies. And they could also then swab the factory and look for the presence of thermos by PCR and find where the thermos was coming from in those plants. So really an ex example again from Paul Potter's group. We've tried to derive ingredients from these uh, bacteria that you find in dairy plants. For example, bactericins have been mentioned. We look for bacteria that produce these bactericins that kill other bacteria. And we found them in microbiome uh, communities and we can now use that live culture to make fermented foods, or we can generate an ingredient from that live culture that we can use to make non-fermented foods or incorporate into fermented foods. And it's very food grade, very economical. Let me just show you an example, uh, again, from uh, Paul Cotter's group of microbiome and food quality when it comes to cheese. What they did was a meta-analysis of cheese microbiomes, highlighting the contribution of different microbiome members to multiple aspects of quality. They actually identified 47 new species that was never known to exist in the cheese uh, matrix, and they contributed significantly to taste or color. And they also found that genes encoding bacteria and other microbials are common. So we took advantage of that to, take, to look at a, an age-old problem in cheddar cheese, for example, when you make cheddar cheese, you add a starter bacterium to the milk to make the cheese, to acidify the milk and, and make the curd. But the dominant bacteria in the ripened cheese is actually non-starter lactic acid bacteria that get in from the cheese environment or the, the factory environment. And these are made up of lots of different species. Here we're just using rapid PCR to show lots of different species in the mature cheese. But if we make the cheese with a bacterium producing starter that we isolated from the cheese microbiome, we now get no non-starter lactic acid bacteria in the cheese. And in fact, the cheese itself is now antimicrobial. This is the melted cheese put in a well on a plate. And if we then take a specific non-starter lactic acid bacterium and make it resistant to the bacterium, we can create a cheese that has only that non-starter lactic acid bacteria. So we move very quickly from a cheese where we have no control over the non-starters and the flavor and the pigment attributes they might contribute to a cheese to a completely controlled environment. And so these are some of the advantages of studying the microbiome of these cheeses. Another bacterium that's used widely in the food industry is nicin. This is the code E234, very complicated molecule. You can buy it and use it in foods. You can see that it works very well. This person is obviously thrilled with the the nicin that's present in whatever food she's eating there. But it's very active in the nanomolar range, active against most gram-positive bacteria, and very nicely that it can be, it's gene encoded and therefore it can be modified. And so we took advantage of this in, again, trying to address this problem of thermos, the pinking uh, bacterium that I described just a couple of slides ago. Unfortunately, natural nicin is not very effective against thermos, and it doesn't control it very well in cheese. So what we did was we manipulated the gene encoding nicin to introduce mutations, and then we screened those mutants for versions of nicin that are better against thermos. We found two. So for example, if you change this methionine uh, to a glutamine, or you change this methionine to a phenylalanine at this point, you get versions of nicin that are much better against thermos. And this could be a way now of controlling thermos and cheese and preventing pinking. This paper will come out uh, in a few weeks time in the Journal of Dairy Science. And just to touch again on the theme of this meeting, uh, microbiomes or uh, biofilms. Here's a strep uberus biofilm. And here's nicin. Nicin is not very good at eliminating the strep uberus biofilm. 
as it's on a stainless steel coupon, you can see that if anything, the biofilm looks to be even uh, more intense on the nice and treated biofilm. But um, when we use this nice and variant that has a, an amino acid change, we can now destroy that biofilm very effectively. And this is work from Mariana perez Ibaresh in our lab, and it, it has been submitted at the moment. And perhaps the most interesting area of all, of course, is the human microbiome. How can we take advantage of the human microbiome? What role does the human microbiome play in human health and disease? Well, this is a paper published in Journal of Experimental Medicine by Susan Lynch, an Irish scientist who's now head of a microbiome institute in UCSF in uh, San Francisco. And what this shows is some of the diseases in which the human microbiota has been implicated, things like inflammatory bowel disease, obesity, metabolic syndrome, atherosclerosis, diabetes, liver disease, infectious disease. The range of diseases the microbiome has been implicated in is extraordinary. But when you consider again that we evolved in a microbial world and the microbiome is essentially a microbial organ within the body, maybe it's not so surprising that there's so many diseases that have been linked. And I won't go through this table, of course, but that's from that paper. There's also been a very interesting link between the gut and the brain. So the bacteria in the gut influence brain function. Now this would have seemed farcical or, or fanciful only a few years ago, but now the evidence is really overwhelming that the microbiome can influence cognition, stress responses, eating behavior, depression, by two main means. One is that the microbes can produce chemicals like GABA, serotonin, acetylcholine that can travel to the brain and also they can influence the vagus nerve, which uh, can connect to the brain and influence brain function. And we can isolate bacteria from the microbiome that have effects on the brain. And my colleagues here in APC, John Crian and Ted Dynan, uh, have coined the term psychobiotic for probiotics that affect the brain. And they've published a very big selling book on that that's been translated into other languages. So I'd encourage you to go and read that if you're interested in this area of microbiome science. Perhaps one of the most fascinating areas of microbiome uh, science is the role that microbiomes play in the efficacy of different therapies. I think everybody will have heard of um, different cancer treatments, blockade uh, treatments, checkpoint inhibitors, and these checkpoint inhibitors don't work in every individual. And what these two back-to-back -back papers in science showed was that it's the gut microbiome that influences the efficacy of these checkpoint inhibitors against tumors, both epithelial tumors and melanomas. And if I highlight it a little bit down here, you can see the metagenomic of patient stool samples reveal correlations between the clinical response to these uh, checkpoint inhibitors and the relative abundance of a single bacterium, Acromancia mucinifera. If you orally supplement with Acromancia mucinifera, you restore the efficacy of these um, checkpoint inhibitors. So imagine that you have cancer and the cancer treatment is not working and you can restore efficacy by simply adding a member of the microbiome back into your microbiome. An extraordinary uh, glimpse of what might be yet to come from microbiome science. Microbiome can even overcome host genetic defects. Now, as many of you will know, and many individuals are lactose intolerant, they can't drink milk. And these two pay, and that's because of a reduction in the enzyme lactase in the, produced by the, the human host. These two papers from Sasha Jernikova's lab uh, in Groningen in the Netherlands, both published in Nature Genetics, act, made this incredible correlation between the presence of this mutation that makes your lactase negative and the abundance of bifidobacterium. And bifidobacterium is a genus which is, has very high lactase uh, production. So what they spotted was that some individuals who are genetically lactose intolerant were actually able to tolerate lactose. And that's because they had very high levels of bifidobacterium. So the, your microbiome can actually trump essentially your genetics. You can have a genetic defect that your microbiome can overcome. So another glimpse of the power of the microbiome here. And very interestingly, the microbiome also plays a very significant role in aging. This is a paper uh, led by Paula Toole from APC Microbiome Ireland 
uh, published some years ago, which showed that the gut microbiota composition correlates with diet and health in the elderly. So this is an association that people with long stay in long stay institutions had a very different microbiome from people of equal age living in the community. And also, of course, health declined significantly in that orientation. And what Paul and his colleagues uh, investigated was by diet, could you reverse this change in the microbiome and reverse these health declines? And he published a paper just uh, last year in GOT showing that putting people onto a Mediterranean diet increases the diversity of the gut microbiome and is accompanied by reduced frailty, improving health status. Uh, I think a very influential paper showing that you can redress microbiome deficiencies and health deficiencies through dietary interventions in elderly people. And we can also, again, mine next generation probiotics. I've already mentioned Acromansa mucinifila from the uh, cancer study. But what has also been shown is the administration of acromantia in mice at least uh, also reduces, present, prevents the development of obesity even if the mice are on a high fat diet. And what they were able to do was develop kind of a probiotic, a next generation probiotic based on acromantia. They were also able to go a step further and show that it's a specific protein on the outer membrane of acromantia that is responsible for this effect. And so you could either develop a drug or in terms of the protein or a probiotic that you could use in food, for example, or in medicine to redress things like obesity and metabolic syndrome. Fascinating studies here uh, from Patrice Canny's lab in Belgium. Okay, so that was really a, a whistle-stop tour through the microbiome from the farm all the way to the colon, the different way it influences us. And what I wanted to, to hopefully leave you with was the idea that microbiome science provides with this incredibly powerful lens with which to assess the impact of microbes throughout the food chain. It doesn't replace microbiology, it augments microbiology and empowers microbiology, traditional microbiology. But I do think the microbiome will be an invaluable guide to help us shaping therapeutic and di dietary modalities to improve both animal and human health and plant production for that matter. And I want to stress, I think the microbiome is a rich source of interventions from farm to colon. I was going to use a, a, another expression that rhymes better from grass to, and I'll leave that asterisk there, but I think you'd be glad I, I stuck with farm to colon. And the kind of hyperbolic claim from this uh, study is that I think studying the microbiome really does change our understanding of what it means to be a human. We're actually, um, not, we're much more than our human genetics and our human cells. We're kind of a hollow biont, and we, we need to consider our microbiomes when we consider our own health. And I want to thank, of course, a lot of people uh, who helped in, in creating the, the material that I used here, people from all over the world, and I'm not going to list here, but Paul Ross, my uh, main collaborator on everything I've shown here, Paul Cotter, whose work I depended on a bit, and uh, Lorraine, everyone in the lab, my APC colleagues, Science Foundation Ireland, and of course, SFAM and the National Biofilms Innovation Centre for inviting me to give this talk. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Colin, for a, a fascinating journey and perspective. Very grounded, I felt, in terms of putting anchoring us all in where the microbiome fits in the overall field of microbiology and the great journey from farm to colon, or maybe you've coined the new phrase there very well. Um, so I just wondered, Will, at this point, do we have any questions you'd like to field, if I can use that pun, to, um, <laughs> to Colin, thank you. Yes, absolutely. So we have one from um, Deb Smith, who asks, uh, food allergies are on the increase. Do you think the development of these allergies are linked to microbiomes? Yes, is the short answer. I mean, it, it, there's certainly lots of links. Um, Allergies, of course, are an immune response. Most of the immune system is in the gut and on the skin surface where we have most contact with microbes. So developing tolerance early in life uh, is very important. And it's been shown as well that some probiotics administered very in early infancy can prevent allergies developing in infants at a high risk of developing allergies. So yes, there's absolutely a link. Thank you. Um, the next question comes from Jim Bullock who says that the work on lactose intolerance is very interesting. 
dietary intolerance to other saccharides is of growing interest. Do we know about any similar microbiome or genetics overlaps in that case? No, I'm not aware of any. I suspect more will emerge. That study, the Sasha Jarnikova study, was published in Nature Genetics literally only a week or two ago. So I think that's the first one that really makes that connection, you know, the, the copper fastens that connection. The, the presence or absence of bifidobacteria informs the phenotype that people will experience when they consume lactose. Thank you. And one final one we have from within our, our panelists team. Uh, we'd like to know how likely is it that control of livestock microbiome will be a, a normal part of animal husbandry in the near future? I, I think we're, we're not there yet, but we're going to get there. I mean, if you don't know, you know, if, if somebody was to ask you, is liver function important in an animal as it's developing and, and growing, you would say, well, of course, it's a hugely important organ within the body. You need to have good liver function. Well, as I said, the microbiome is an organ within the body. And we want it to develop in as natural and healthy way as possible and contribute as much as possible to production. And we've got to the point now where you can do sequencing on a little handheld sequencer that you can plug into your iPhone and read off the sequence in real time. So I think we really will have uh, almost real time monitoring and correction of microbiome deficiencies at the farm and at the, in the clinic as well.